everyone, I'm Angela and welcome back to my channel. Today I have a very special guest here with me on my channel. It's Dr. Elliot Cohen from Leeds Beckett University. Elliot is a psychologist. His main area of expertise is uh, psychology and the overlaps between psychology, especially transpersonal psychology and religion and spirituality. So thank you very much, Elliot. Here's Elliot. Now you have appeared in the video. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, here I am. <laughs> thank you for being here, Elliot. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so today we will talk about a very interesting topic, which I really look forward to knowing more about, and that is Kabbalah. Mm. Yes. Kabbalah, the Hebrew word to receive. Okay, so first off, I, I mispronounced it as you... <laughs> no, no, Kabbalah. It's Kabbalah. Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Kabbalah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, Same. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, everyone will understand what you mean. You could say that in Israel and people would go, yeah, Kabbalah. <laughs> okay. So it works. Yeah, so first off, since you mentioned that to me in a private message, could you please mm -hmm. explain us the different spellings of Kabbalah? Yeah. Of course, I, I will put the, the spellings on the screen so that people okay. know what we are but talking people, about. People can see them. Yes, yeah, so usually Kabbalah with a K, uh, which is the Kabbalah that I was most familiar with, is the um, traditional Jewish um, mystical practices and um, schools of thought, philosophy, um, prophecy, um, and also the more sort of Asur forbidden uh, practical Kabbalah, which uh, many would relate to different magical practices and traditions, which I'll probably be saying um, a little bit more about um, later. But uh, if it's spelt with a K, then usually it's, it's recognized that this is the sort of Jewish tradition, um, sort of going all the way back to some of those uh, earliest texts like the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, uh, the Sefer Bahir, um, the uh, Sefer Zohar, uh, the Book of Splendor. Um, and these are sort of like, if you like, the core the corpus, sort of main texts of, uh, of the Jewish mystical tradition. Of course, we should say that the, the main texts are those first five books of the Bible, uh, referred to as the, as the Torah, um, and if you like, that's the um, sort of traditional uh, Jewish uh, roots, foundations um, of, of Kabbalah with a K. Uh, but then, as I think in different chats we had, I mentioned that uh, medieval times, Renaissance, you get various um, hermetic schools, um, sort of occult uh, traditions uh, that become interested in these esoteric Jewish writings and start to... Um, start to explore them, start to incorporate them into their uh, Christian doctrines. So usually uh, Kabbalah with a C. Even today, often I'll see more sort of uh, more, more Christian universalist um, approaches to Kabbalah um, will be spelt sometimes with a, with a C. Uh, sometimes hermetic traditions will be spelt with a C or a Q. Uh, usually when I see it with a Q, oh, that's my little one shouting in the background. Um, if you spell it with a Q, you hear a shout like that, and that means it's usually a sort of magical uh, tradition, uh, you know, that magic with a K, as you said in, um, in sort of previous, uh, in a previous talk that you, uh, that you gave. So it's, um, it's not unusual to see it uh, rendered in those different ways. So usually for shorthand, if it's, if it's with a K, it's usually referring to the um, traditional Jewish context, uh, if it's with a C, it could be Christian forms of Kabbalah. It could be more um, universalist or even what some would refer to as um, sort of new, new Age interpretations or incorporations. Um, and if it's with a Q, then often it can be either the hermetic or, or magical um, traditions. Hopefully that's nice and clear. Yeah, yeah, it is very clear now. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I didn't know all that, so... It's... Yeah, well, it's, you know... But I think one of the things that, that always strikes me when I hear other people um, who are not from the Jewish tradition is say, I'm a Kabbalist or I, I study Kabbalah. 
um, I'm, I'm always really surprised, and I think that's partly because of the way I was 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 brought up in, in relation to Kabbalah. Um, Kabbalah, for, for for most Jewish people, um, even even today, it's something quite uh, quite distant. It's something quite um, well, in many cases, forbidden. Um, it's you know occult, hidden secrets, uh, not intended for the masses. And, you know, and just to give a, a few points, there are certain minhag or, or traditions, let's say. I don't think they're, they're fixed and fast uh, laws or halakha rules, uh, rules and laws. But um, there were certain conditions before you could even begin to study Kabbalah. One was that you had to be over the age of 40. Um, the other was that you had to be a man. Um, the other was the uh, surprise, surprise. And the other was you had to be uh, married with children. And the other was, that I think, in the in the text, says you need to have a full belly. And what they uh, interpreted from this is that you already had to be uh, full of the existing um, um, revealed wisdom of Torah. You had to be fully uh, compliant with the halakha, the norms and sort of regular regulations um, expected of you. And if all those conditions uh, were met... Um, then you might be um, eligible to, to study uh, this, this Kabbalah. And, and so, you know, usually we're sort of introduced to it uh, in those ways, it's all these different conditions. And then if that's not enough, if that's not enough to sort of you know, put you off a bit, um, there are these uh, stories, uh, and you find them in the, uh, in the Talmud. I think there's one part in Sanhedrin. It's a very famous story. It's um, about what's called the Pardes. Pardes, um, well, it's, it's an ancient Hebrew word that means orchard. I think it probably etymologically has its roots in um, sort of ancient Persian uh, paradise, um, Pardes, um, you know, the Garden of Eden. Sometimes a, a word, uh, a substitute word, related word is, is Pardes. You're told that these four great rabbis um, enter the Pardes. Um, and you know, what does this mean? It says, well, Pardes in this sense, it means they enter this uh, mystical divine reality. Um, but it could also be understood as they enter the Pardes. Pardes is um, an acronym, if you like. Um, par uh, pa is for Pashat, which means the simple, everyday, accessible meaning of Torah, of the teachings. And then there's um, Remez, uh, which means sort of like a hint, going a little bit deeper. There's Drash, which sort of uh, might be the moral dimension. Um, and then there's Sod, the last one, the S of Pardes, which is secret. Sod is the secret. So if you like, it's a hermeneutic tool. It sort of gives you these levels of depth that you can interpret a text, um, so this is hermeneutics, uh, exegesis. Um, I've never been quite sure. I struggle sometimes the difference between those. They kind of blend into one another sometimes. But it could mean this as well that they delve into this this depth. Um, but if you read the account in the Talmud, it seems that they do enter this mystical realm. They sort of um, sort of slip out of our dimension and into this this heavenly celestial realm and what happens to these great four rabbis we're told that you know some of the greatest rabbis of their time uh i always remember the first one ben azai the rabbi ben azai it says ben azai gazed and died that's a great start isn't it <laughs> he gazed and died um, the other one loses his mind um the other rabbi becomes a heretic um he misunderstands the vision the vision's all very very cryptic um, it gives you a little bit of, of what they saw uh, in the Talmud, and it, it just doesn't equate with reality as we know it. And so some of these rabbis, they couldn't understand what they saw, and, and one of them became, I think, um, kind of almost like a polytheist, maybe sort of more Gnostic in terms of what what, what he thought he saw. Um, the only one, the only one rabbi, um, and this is um, Rabbi Akiva, it says, Akiva entered in peace and left in peace. So of these great four rabbis, you know, one dies, one loses his mind, uh, one becomes a heretic, and only one enters in peace and left. And these are the stories that usually, you know, you're shared with. This is, this is Kabbalah. Um, these are the greatest. Are you on that level? <laughs> as, uh, yeah, as it's like, 
It's like, Kabbalah, the odds are not in your favor. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, you know, it's, um, you know, traditionally it was uh, leave this alone. This is for the, for the great sort of sages. Um, Do you think that was a way of saying that it was a dangerous practice that only a few people had to... I th yeah, and I think the, the danger was considered, particularly in relation to what was called practical Kabbalah. Now, here we end up getting into some of the distinctions. So the kind of um, Kabbalah maybe that, uh, that I've become more familiar with and, and studied with different teachers um, has been mostly theoretical or philosophical, uh, has been mostly the hermeneutic type or exegesis, looking at the um, language of the Bible and sort of kind of very playful way, hermeneutic, sort of playful way of interpreting a back and forth of, of meaning. And Kabbalah, um, one of my um, favorite teachers of Kabbalah, Professor Les Lancaster, um, who was actually the first professor of transpersonal psychology in the UK, but also a Kabbalist, um, he refers to it often as, you know, um, Kabbalah is a mysticism of language, uh, which I always found very very beautiful, um, that it's about the, the Hebrew letters and the different levels of reality and meaning that there are, um, there are letters within letters, words within words, and worlds within worlds. And it's, it's very sort of beautiful um, once you start to sort of navigate it, explore it. Um, and That's the way uh, Les Lancaster often taught it. It was, uh, it was a mysticism of language. And it was, um, again, it had that kind of playful quality to it. And it's certainly not considered as, um, as risky, let's say, as some of the other forms of, of practice. So, um, for example, practical Kabbalah would be um, the use of some of these teachings, uh, particularly the teachings around the divine names. Um, the names, the various names of, of the divine uh, in Judaism have kind of an awesome quality, so much so that um, we, we don't even say them. <laughs> you know, even, even if you like the, uh, some of the lesser names, if there are lesser names, we have substitutes for um, so instead of saying um, God, most Jewish people will say Hashem, literally the name. You know, they won't even say God. Even if they write God in English, particularly Orthodox people, they'll write G, put a little dash and D. Why? It's not even Hebrew. You know, it's that level of, um, of safeguarding or what's sometimes referred to as, as putting fences around um, to, to protect. So once you start getting to the divine names, perhaps the most famous, the uh, Tetragrammaton, um, the, uh, sort of the, the four-letter name of God, which became so popular in ceremonial uh, magic. Magic circles, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, you, 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 find it, you find it everywhere um, in, in ceremonial magic. You know, it, it was seen as sort of this, this powerhouse. Um, this is, if you like, the, uh, the name of creation. And, and from this, other names emerge, and some names are even more secret. Um, you know, there's a, there's a 72-letter name, there's a 216-letter name, and, um, you know, the holiest, uh, the holiest of names um, was apparently only uh, recited out loud once a year um, in, um, in Jerusalem, in the temple, uh, by the Kohen Gadol. Uh, you'll notice my last name, Cohen, is um, supposed to be um, the name for the priest. I'm um, sort of the lineage on my sort of father's and my mother's side, actually, but uh, they tend to focus more on the, on the patrilineal in this case, um, in terms of where your tribe comes from. Whether you're Jewish or not, your halakhic status comes from your mother. In terms of what your, your tribe or lineage, that comes usually from your father. Um, so my name Cohen is supposed to be that I'm a Kohen, a priest. And so my ancestors 2,000 or so years ago, particularly the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, only at this very special allotted time, Yom Kippur, the holiest of holy times, in the holiest of holy places, Jerusalem, temple, in the, in the holiest place, the holy of holies, it was called, you're getting the, the holy emphasis here, and spoke the holiest of names. Um, and it was so holy 
that the people wouldn't even want to hear it. They drown it out. They, they, the people around it, the, the Levites, the other um, the, servants of the servants of the priests and the other people in the temple would shout out, Kadosh, 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 like holy, 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 to, to kind of drown it out a bit uh, because it was see, too holy to hear. You know, these, these words um, are considered so potent, so powerful. They are the tools of creation. Um, and perhaps of destruction as well. So they have to be wielded with, with great care. And this is, I think, very much picked up on in the hermetic tradition, in the magical traditions, the power of words. You know, one of, one of the spells that we, we grow up with, even at sort of children's parties with, uh, with, with magicians, sort of conjuring, abracadabra, you know, uh, that, that comes from the Hebrew, abara, bara meaning to create, kadabara, Daber, through what I say, literally, uh, I create through speech. May what I say come to be. Abaraka dabra. So, you know, this ancient Hebrew Aramaic um, formula, I think, recognizes the, the potency, the power of of these names. Um, and I think there's something about the um, secrecy around these names that became, you know, whenever you cover something, whenever something's concealed, it becomes um, an object of, of, of fascination, of, um, of sort of, a, of tension, of, of, of taboo as well. Uh, there's all these prohibitions of not saying the name. That's my, one of my favorite scenes in the life of Brian, uh, where, where someone's... <laughs> You've probably seen that one where someone says the name. Of course, you know, there's no J in, in Hebrew. So, uh, you know, that's that's fine anyway. But um, it's I think it, it sort of illustrates the power, uh, the power of words, the power of language, the power of, of writing as well. Um, you know, the writing of these names. If, if there's a book where any of these names appear, um, it can't be disposed of. Um, it, it has to be buried. Um, in, you know, usually they'll wait till someone there's a funeral, a Jewish funeral, and they, they will bury the books because they have these names in. Um, so I'm not surprised there were um, sort of other people, non-Jewish traditions that thought, what what are these names? What is this uh, this untapped uh, power? You know, uh, let's um, you know let's find out what these secrets are, and uh, let's let's try and incorporate them and, and use them. For, for magical purposes, for the purposes of, of, of gnosis, of, of self-knowledge, knowledge of the divine, for um, knowledge of um, how to create, how to transform. Um, and I think this is something that comes from the traditional Kabbalah of the K um, and, and Jewish tradition in general uh, that was very much picked up on by the Hermetic tradition, the idea that uh, there is the divine spark uh, within all of us, that people are um, in in the, in the Torah as human beings are a little less than the angels, um, but there's also the term but selam elokim uh, in the image of the divine. Human beings are essentially a, a divine microcosm. So you'll see this in certain Kabbalistic diagrams: um, the, the tree of life, um, or the Adam Kadmon, the primordial man which is sometimes mapped on to this, this tree of life. You're probably familiar with the, the tree of life. Um, yeah, the I think that it, everybody everyone who, who's knows, ever, yeah. Been, yeah, who's yeah, ever I mean, been interested in esotericism knows what the exactly, tree of life is. I mean, I mean, just to give you a sense of how, in, in a sense, how every day this was to me growing up, the synagogue that I went to as a child and was bar mitzvahed in, in Leeds, was called Etz Chaim, the tree of life. Um, so, you know, this is, this is just where I went um, and, you know, I suppose this is where I started to um, become interested in, in Kabbalah. So we, we've got all these different um, sort of prohibitions. And I suppose from, from my own reason, how, how did I, you know, if, if you've got to be over 40 and, and married and, and you know, how, how on earth did I encounter it in the first place? And, and so young as well. I was uh, uh, 15, 16. And the reason was because I had an interest already in the the occult, the, the esoteric, and increasingly the, the, inverted commas, the Eastern as well. And because my room began to um, frighten my parents, it became uh, filled with um, sort of uh, pentagrams and, and various sort of imagery, um, sort of magical symbols. 
and then um, sort of increasingly Eastern symbols and, and Buddhas started appearing, um, they, they were a bit worried and they consulted the rabbi. And the rabbi said, quick, get him some Kabbalah books. <laughs> he's like, quick, get him into something a little bit more kosher, a bit more, you know, otherwise he's going to go way off. He needs well, to would it be like, uh, like saying, okay, since he's interested in historicism, he might as well do the Hebrew kind of Exactly, history. exactly. And I suppose we were living in a time then as well, um, you know, about two, three centuries ago, with the birth of what's referred to as the Hasidic Uh, movements, uh, beginning with people like the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, the name Baal Shem Tov is fascinating. He's usually thought of as this great kind of um, person that, that uh, renewed Judaism, made it much more, um, much more kind of spontaneous in terms of prayer, much more free um, and much more mystical as well. The name Baal Shem Tov quite literally means Baal, meaning master uh, Shem Tov of, of the good name. Um, which suggests uh, that he had knowledge of the divine names. This part's not talked about as much. Uh, he's referred to as a wonder worker, um, that he had all sorts of, uh, of magical abilities, the ability to, to juggle time, um, to sort of, uh, sort of play with time and space. Um, the, the expression sometimes is, is time juggling, which was one I was fascinated by. Uh, there was a rabbi friend of mine, actually, who, who gave a fantastic talk a few years ago, Um, he looked at the name Ribono Shelolam, which literally translates as Master of Space Time. This is one of the names that's given um, to, to God, the Master of Space and Time. So the idea is that if you, if you could master the names, um, would it give you some or, or more control over, over space and time? So you can see how, how tempting maybe um, some of this some of this is and why they wanted to keep people away from what they call practical Kabbalah, actively applying this. Um, because you, we have all sorts of uh, stories that you find in the Talmud and in the Kabbalah itself. Uh, the one that people are perhaps most familiar with is the famous story of the Golem of Prague. Um, that's the um, animation of a clay figure to protect the Jewish community of Prague by um, Rabbi um, Judah Lowe, I think, was the uh, name of the Maharal of Prague, um, who uses the Kabbalah, um, uses the divine names to animate this figure of clay, this golem. Uh, he uses particular Hebrew uh, words. The word that's most famous that he uses uh, is the word emet, which is like the on switch. Um, it's the first, middle, and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It means truth. And I get also, if you add up the letters, because each letter is also a number, uh, it adds up to one of the divine names. Um, so it has all these different qualities uh, to it. And yeah, and now there is still the, the belief that you can create a golem in the esoteric communities. Yes. I mean, it's, you know, it's seen in the, um, I mean, the, the books, the recipe books often found in one of the earliest Kabbalistic texts, the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation. Um, they even made, made an X-Files episode about this years ago. Um, this woman whose husband is murdered and she, uh, to, to avenge him, she makes, she makes a golem. Um, and they sort of, um, show the whole, show the whole process, um, as, as they imagined it. Um, at the end, when they want to deactivate the golem, um, they lick their finger and, and wipe off the Aleph, um, which leaves the word uh, mem and tet, met, which means dead, inert, inactive. It's like an off switch. Um, so, you know, the stories of, of the golem, I mean, you only need to go to Prague today uh, and see um, the, the way this story has become so much part of the tourist industry there. But there's some weird stuff that goes on in terms of how this makes people think of, of the Jewish community. Um, and the associations which were prevalent in medieval times uh, between Jews and sorcery, um, you know, th this became really, really problematic um, because, as I said, Kabbalah was, was the domain of so, so very few. But here you have this idea that Judaism itself in some way is, is related to sort of sorcery. Most people don't know a lot about Judaism. Most Christians, the only thing they know at that time about Jews is that they've been excluded. They live in these little shtetls and ghettos. They have this uh, quality of otherness about them. They don't believe in Jesus. 
Um, so as a result of that, they're seen as, as anti-Christ. As a result of that, they're seen as anti-Christ. It's, it's only a little jump from that. Um, and then you have this idea that the, the, the Jewish people are somehow um, sorcerers or even, you know, in, in league with the devil. I mean, you know, in, in, the, in the Jewish tradition, there isn't really this, this same um, sort of developed Christian mythology um, about, about the devil um, or even heaven and hell in, in quite the same way. Um, but all of this was kind of projected onto all these fears um, so you, you get the, in terms of the history of antisemitism, you get sort of these various blood libels, accusations, you know, ridiculous accusations made against the Jews. They use blood of ch Christian children in their rituals. You know, blood isn't even kosher. You can't, you can't use it. You know, even if you're eating meat, you could try and get rid of as, as much of the blood as possible. It was based on such fear and ignorance, all these projections. The, the Jew was... Um, essentially sort of the sorcerer, the magus, the, you know, this dangerous, um, dangerous figure. They pray in this strange language. It isn't Latin. Um, you know, what is this, this text? So uh, all these sort of obsessions. And if you look at the statue of Rabbi Judah Lowe in Prague, he looks like this terrifying kind of um, sorcerer character. You know, he doesn't look like this sort of friendly, approachable rabbi. Um, likewise with some of the images of the golem, it's these, uh, these monstrous um, images. And so the, the image of, of, of the Jew in, in, in Prague still today, I think, is, is one that's um, kind of interwoven with, with fears and ideas of, of magic and, and sorcery, um, which, again, if you place into the context of what I've told you about Kabbalah, it's very, very strange considering, one, how few people study it in the first place, and then how almost no one would ever be encouraged to do the practical Kabbalah. The, the, there's one rabbi, one, and he died I think, 10, 20 years ago, uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Kaduri. This is the only rabbi I know of, and he was in his hundreds or something when he died. It's the only rabbi I know of who was permitted to do practical Kabbalah, to write amulets. And these were always for things like for healing or for a couple to have a child. He was the only one I know of that actually Rabbi said, yeah, this guy, this guy's kosher. This guy's OK um, for, for anyone else. <laughs> you know, you, you, you don't do this because how does how does this work? Well, you know, I, I managed to get hold of one of his um, amulets and I'll, I'll send you a, a picture that you can sort of flash up during this. You'll, you'll see that it actually uses names of angels. Very familiar. You know, the same practice you'll find in different forms of ceremonial magic. Um, I guess, even even in Enochian magic, they use a lot of yeah, yeah, you know, and and so you know, this is you'll, you'll see this in this um, in this amulet in this kamia um, that he's written the names of certain angels to to help. Now, what he hasn't done, and he was very clear that you know you don't do this, um, is you don't bind the angels in an oath. Um, so if you're if you're working with uh, in his case working with angels. Certain earlier stories of Solomon in terms of the building of the temple, he's working with angels and demonic forces, and this kind of fired the imagination. So you get sort of texts like the uh, the key of Solomon, the greater and the lesser key, that sort of all to do with sort of angelic names and demonic names, and um, sort of various sort of pentagrams and, and sort of versions of, of, of Hebrew and divine names. Um, but for um, for this rabbi, you'll see that he just he uses the angels' names, but he doesn't bind them. And the idea was that, uh, you know, well, um, if, if you want to help out, please help out, but I'm not going to bind you. Because uh, the idea was that, you know, if you, if you bind an angel or a demon, they get a bit pissed off. And afterwards, you know, once you've finished sort of the, the magic or the practical sort of Kabbalistic request, you have to deal with the aftermath. Um, it's a bit like riding a tiger. It's, you know... Getting off is the hard part. You know? So uh, as far as he was concerned, you know, you, you don't bind using oaths. Uh, and this is, I think, still quite a big part of a lot of ceremonial magic, sort of like a binding. If you know the name, the secret name, you have power over. Um, so, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of difference um, in, in the way this is used. But, I mean, just, just in terms of, of, of angels, like the, the archangels, uh, Michael, Gabriel, you know, Raphael, um, 
you know, when you see ceremonial magicians and they're casting their circles for protection, often they're using, invoking uh, these angelic entities. And what, what's interesting is how this is so much part of, of mainstream, not even esoteric Kabbalah, um, when Jewish children and adults uh, go to bed, they will recite the bedtime Shema. The Shema is like the central statement of faith in Judaism. Uh, you know, hear, O Israel, uh, the Lord is one. The, the, the Lord is well, the Lord is God. The Lord is one. Uh, Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And there's that sort of quality of oneness that you're supposed to focus on. Um, and you know, after that, there's some additional prayers, and one of those is essentially calling the angels. You know, at the, the foot of your bed, at round bed, you, literally before you go to sleep, um, you surround, you call it. And I remember being absolutely fascinated when I started to study um, some aspects of, of ceremonial magic. It was like, it's the angels again. They're, they're, they're using them. Um, you know, they're calling them. Um, and, you know, the only thing that was often missing was the reference to the Shekhinah, the divine presence above. Um, usually they just deal with the angels, um, the angelic forces, which... They'd also relate often to the elements. So you'd find this kind of more... Um, yeah, it's like the, the four like, archangels yeah. are related to the four corners and the four <laughs> elements. Yeah, so you, you'd, you'd see that as well. I think they do this a lot in her, hermetic uh, forms of Kabbalah and, and um, magical forms. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the magic of correspondence often. So, um, I mean, so Crowley uses this, Hermetic uses this, you know, each, each one of the sephirot, the divine attributes um, that's shown in the Tree of Life, has all these other associations. Now, they have associations in the, in the traditional um, sort of uh, Kabbalistic uh, traditions as well, but they add all sorts of other things um, in the Hermetic tradition, like, you know, you, you might find this... This one now is associated with um, the goddess Sophia, or this one's associated with Isis, or, or other sort of a Greek or Egyptian uh, gods or goddesses. Um, you know, th there's a fair amount of astrology already in certain parts of Kabbalah, references to uh, the planets. Um, but again, this is this is a complicated area. Um, you know, there, there are sort of versions of Jewish astrology. But for the most part, uh, again, the idea was that, um, you know, if you follow the various halakha, the sort of Jewish rule and ritual, and, you know, that is supposed to protect you from the influences of the planets. Um, and this, this comes to the whole area called the, the mazal, um, which can relate to stars and sort of luck or fortune. Um, again, this is something that's rarely spoken about, but it is there. Uh, there's quite a rich tradition of um, of, of astrology um, in that you'll find in certain Jewish Kabbalist texts, even the more traditional with a K, um, but it's perhaps less explored. Um, I've got one of my um, uh, rabbi friends, Rabbi uh, Aaron David Rubin. Um, he has um, kind of specialised on sort of ancient forms of, of Jewish um, astrology, so he's certainly the expert. Um, there, he's, he's um, sort of given talks in this in the past. Um, but the, the idea here was that you could be, um, you, you know, you don't want to be under the influences of the planet. You want to be sort of free from them. And so uh, the, the idea was that if you can develop um, this perfect faith, um, this alleviates all these negative influences, the, the evil eye or planetary influences. Um, so um, it, it as you, you can see, there's quite a lot of tensions uh, within the system. So basically, there, there are a lot of differences between the traditional Kabbalah and how Kabbalah has been reinterpreted and adopted by ceremonial circles. Yeah, very much so. I mean, even down to things like um, sort of pronunciations of, of, of different, different names that probably a Jewish person would, would never do. Uh, would be very, very cautious with, with that. You, you see them being used very freely and, and openly, um, sort of written and, um, and then sort of used to invoke um, various sort of angelic forces. I mean, one of the first stories that I was um, sort of, that I remember, it was from this uh, golden treasury of Jewish tales, uh, I was read as a child, 
And it, it forever sort of got rid of that idea that angels are these wonderful, ethereal, beautiful sort of, um, or, or the, the cherubs, the cherubim were these um, little chubby faced babies. They were bloody terrifying. You know, every story where an angel appears, the person faints or they freak out or they lose their mind. You know, these terrifying uh, celestial beings. And uh, there's, this is uh, this picture, I always remember, I'll send you the picture because uh, it's the one that got kind of burned into my consciousness of uh, these great rabbis who are, are trying to conquer evil in the world. And they um, they call Sandalphon, uh, the angel Sandalphon. And the picture of this angel and the, the rabbis are all kind of prostrated on the floor, turning their faces. They can't even look. Uh, you know, they're absolutely terrified and they need to ask permission to sort of recover their senses so they can either in, even interact Um Again, there seems to be within the non-Jewish traditions of, of, of Kabbalah, you know, um, they they kind of rush in where angels fear to tread, so to borrow that old term. Um, you know, there seems to be a much more sort of, yeah, just just invoke this angel, it'll be fine. You know, it's, uh, it's a much more... Yeah, because it's an angel, it's not a demon, so you're going to be fine. Maybe it's a maybe in that case is a Christian kind of um, interpretation we may say. Yeah, maybe. I mean, they were kind of um, you know they they they're given a much more benign human appearance. I think um, in Christian iconography, you know, they're they're almost always just sort of winged human figures. Uh, they they tend not to, you know. I mean, the descriptions of somebody angels, you know mind-blowing wheels within wheels or heads of, 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 of lions and eagles and humans. Uh, you know, sometimes there is a bit of an overlap in terms of appearance with the demonic. Um, some of the um, demonic entities are also described as having sort of a human head and the head of a, a bull or an eagle. So, you know, being able to know the difference is uh, quite different. It's quite difficult as well. Something you're warned a lot about to turn you here Straight away, if you start studying um, the uh, Zohar, um, it's a term, Altra which translates as the other side. Um, and this is slippery, and this is when it starts, you know, you might imagine you're starting to get prophetic insights or, or powers or the power to heal. And there's always a question, where is that power coming from? Is it coming from this, the side of the divine? Or is it coming from the Altra which often imitates the divine? So if you're having um, a book dictated to you by an angelic force, is it an angelic force or, or is, it, is it actually demonic? Where does it come from? Um, so the, there's... Uh, What's the difference between um, angels and demons since you, you mentioned that angels are not these benign figures? Um, so what's the difference then between angels and demons in Kabbalah? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, the sort of main difference, I think, is that uh, the, I mean, ev everything is essentially under the um, divine rule. Um, there isn't the same idea of almost like independence. Um, and even some of the demonic forces um, we're, we're told in some of the, they, they also study the Torah. Uh, they're also subservient to the divine. Um, it, it seems that, they, that what, what differs is their attitude towards humanity. Um, they might have a more malevolent attitude, more, more jealousy. Um, I mean, even at the beginning of creation, in certain discussions in the Talmud, uh, you have certain of the Malachim, the angels, um, sort of feeling a bit put out that, you know, humans are being created, but Selem Elohim in the image of the divine. Uh, why? Why are they being favored in this way? Um, put in this garden. Um, given the, you know, we're told that, um, you know, Adam is almost sort of like co-creator in naming the creatures. We know the power of names um, in, in, in sort of the Kabbalistic texts. Um, so, you know, this led to certain feelings, perhaps, of, of, of jealousy. Um, and this is sometimes related to the, uh, maybe the left-hand side of the tree of life, um, related to Gavura or judgment. Uh, or restriction, but that from this um, comes what might refer to as some of the more demonic forces. And these are often associated, I think, also with the tree of um, knowledge of good and evil in 
contrast to the, the tree of life, that these are understood often as being the roots of some of the uh, demonic forces that might seek to harm humans. Um, so I think it's um, that, that tends to be um, some that's approaching an answer in terms of, of the distinction. But the um, yeah, in in terms of the the effect of encountering one, it's still this uh, encounter with the numinous, um, this sort of sense of of awe of being overwhelmed, something intruding into your reality that you're you're rarely prepared for. Um, just as the four rabbis entering the pardes, um, you know, the, the, they're, most of them are overcome. So th- there is this this sense of, um, you know, you you kind of don't explore too much in order to protect yourself, uh, and you don't use these um, divine names, or you know, if if you do, you do so very very carefully, very cautiously. So um, most of the what we have Kabbalah today um, is actually um, a you, you might say kind of safer version in the form of what's called Hasidus or Hasidut, uh, which came from the Hasidic tradition. They took Kabbalistic ideas and uh, made them more accessible, approachable, relatable. Um, they um, managed in that way they moved away from some of the practices of um of, of using divine names um and sort of looked to ordinary actions sort of a, a mysticism of everyday life if you like um that every moment should be elevated and holy and sacred um so this this became sort of like the, the fundamental sort of core if you like of of of, uh, of, of Hasidut. um so it, it very much has its roots in in, in Kabbalah and Kabbalistic thought and, and thinking, um, but it it doesn't um, it doesn't involve or concern itself with the practical aspects of, of, of Kabbalah. Even though its founder was called the Baal Shem Tov, which, as I said before, suggests knowledge of the divine names. But as um, as you know, as, um, many rabbis will say, if you pick up just an everyday uh, prayer book, uh, a siddur. Um, and open it, you will find that all the prayers, most of the prayers were composed by people that had Kabbalistic knowledge and who used various divine names, sometimes in acrostic forms or, or hidden within the text or within the prayer, um, hidden in plain sight often. Um, so it's, you know, it's there, but it's been rendered in that, in that sense sort of more, more safe um, than using it in a more sort of practical ceremonial Manner. Why do you think that uh, Kabbalah appealed so much to people practicing uh, different forms of esotericism? Why do you think it's so appealing and fascinating and has been implemented so much uh, in these kind of traditions? Yeah, I think part of it's to do with, with the sense of its age. Um, uh, you know, that it just seems so ancient, you know, that these, um, some of these Kabbalistic teachings were told, were, were revealed to Adam, uh, some go all the way back to, to, to Abraham, you know, these kind of, kind of archetypal figures um, of, of the biblical narratives. Uh, and the idea that there is beneath the, the Bible, uh, beneath the revealed, that there is a concealed uh, element too. Um so you find sort of references to these sort of, if you like, hidden knowledge, um, hidden texts. Um, and I think some of these, um, again, I, th- I think a lot of this is very, very archetypal. I mean, talking about archetypes, Jung was fascinated by um, Kabbalah and brings it into his ideas of, of alchemy and, you know, incorporates a lot of Kabbalistic language, particularly in his Red Book, uh, which, which itself was a secret text until a few years ago. Um, you know, people, you know, it was only recently published his red book and then his black book, uh, his, his kind of own personal journey of individuation um, and active imagination meeting these uh, um, kind of archetypal Kabbalistic um, sort of entities and, and, and forms. Um, but I, I think there is something about this sense of antiquity that attracts people. 
and the idea that it was secret. And the fact that even, that even Jewish people themselves spoke about it with hushed tones uh, gave it a sense of something that was, um, you know, perhaps taboo, uh, something that was concealed, esoteric, occult. Um, Forbidden, asor, you'll, you'll hear that word used um, certain times. It is asor to practice this. It is asor to, to study this even. So certain things like um, studying Ezekiel's vision of the, of the chariot, the macabre, uh, you know, this was a sort of restricted area of study. We're not even talking about practical Kabbalah. We're talking about the more philosophical, um, sort of theoretical um, you know, this even was was restricted. So, you know, just just imagine what happens when you start to get to uh, to some of the good stuff. Um, so, I, I think this, um, and I think Hebrew itself, um, because of its of its age and because it was it was unknown um, to so many, it had that that sort of that quality. Um, I always imagine sometimes, you know, people that get like tattoos of Chinese characters and they don't really know what it means. It just it looks amazing. It looks mystical and Eastern. I think there was perhaps something similar going on um, in the Renaissance and perhaps earlier with, with, with Hebrew. You know, what is this magical alphabet? Uh, this is the language that um, they believe the universe was, was created with. You know, it's the blueprint of creation. Um, so what untapped powers are there in this in this language or in these liturgies, um, in these divine names? So I think it was only a matter of time, really, uh, before sort of other other traditions, if you like, um, became interested in and seized seized on these uh, these practices, these names. Um, so I, I think it was it was partly to do with that sense of antiquity. Uh, an idea that perhaps this is something really ancient. Perhaps this is the source, if you like, of, of many of these ideas. Um, yeah, similarly to why people now get get interested so much in shamanism, because many yeah. practitioners believe that it's you know the proto a proto religious form which comes yeah. before yeah. every religion. Yeah. And I think similar claims are made about Kabbalah, that it's, it's almost like it's, it is the primordial mysticism, if you like. It, it's the one that, that, that comes first. I mean, that's very debatable. Um, I mean, there's debate as to, you know, when you can actually pinpoint the beginnings of Kabbalah in the first place. Um, it's impossible to prove any. <laughs> it really, any it really is. But I think it's, it's, something to do with that uh, the sense that it's, that it's archaic, it's, it's ancient, it seems primordial. Um, and, you know, we don't know a lot really about um, things like ancient Egyptian religion or magic. Uh, we, we really don't know that much. You know, there's certain forms of Kemetic, um, this is sort of like re Yeah, um, but, you know, I, I've noticed a lot of hermetic uh, practitioners or people interested in magic will, you know, they'll refer to Moses as this like great magician in the Egyptian hermetic sort of traditions. Um, of course, what they sort of kind of play down a bit is that when that story is told um, in the Torah, it's given in a way to distinguish between um, divine sort of, if you like, um, uh, more theurgic forms of, of, of magic uh, versus um, sort of a mixture perhaps of what they write off as maybe conjuring or something that comes from the Sitra Akhara, the other side. You know, they're using um, Egyptian gods, pagan um, sort of deities to, to, to do their bidding. And of course, in, in the story, um, as you probably remember, uh, you know, this is when we start getting these images of, of staffs swallowing staffs and snakes and, uh, you know, it's... Uh, and, you know, a lot of this imagery we end up seeing in, in alchemy as well. Um, you know, alchemy is something we've spoken a little less of, but, you know, you, you find um, even things like as above, so below. Well, that's something you find in the Kabbalah as well. It's, just, it's that central tenet, the um, sort of the coming together, the blending, the union of the, um, if you like, the Shekhinah, uh, the divine feminine, um, with the um, sort of the Yisudu, with Keter, with the sense of the masculine and the feminine aspects of the tree of life 
blending and coming together of finding this unification. The idea of unification is absolutely central in Kabbalah and Yehud, uh, bringing together um, almost the dispersed fragments of divine names that have been sort of broken up in the process of creation, bringing those back together, this process of what's called tikkun or tikkun olam, healing time and space. Um, certain prayers or practices um, that we might say every day, and this isn't even the Kabbalists, this is just the regular the regular Jewish people, will just say um, maybe at the start of, of one of these rituals, uh, l'shem yehud, for the purpose of uniting, unifying the divine name. And then there might be a little formula uh, that they say to to join the yud and, and the, and the hey part of God's name with the, with the vav and, and the hey to bring those um, together. Um, that certain actions that we that we have in this world make a real difference. And I suppose this is one of the um, what what certain Christian groups would have seen as absolutely heretical uh, that God needs us. Um, that human action. In, in a sense, it's kind of like a partnership with the divine uh, through our actions uh, in this world. That that's what it means by B'Tselem Elohim, made in the image of the divine. Uh, is this heretic? For well, there's an, uh, here's an interesting thing. You know, um, yesterday's heresies become today's orthodoxies. So, you know, the, the Hasidim of centuries ago, at the time, there were harems, there were bands. You know, they, they, they were seen as being these dangerous... Uh, anti-rationalist sort of crazy mystics um you know serve god with joy you know joy itself could be this form of uh avada hashem service to the divine um they tended not to emphasize the sort of the scholarly serious rationalism of, of some of the other more mainstream um jewish movements so at the time they were seen as the uh kind of <clears throat> sort of kind of dangerous um, renegades in, in, in many ways. But over time, uh, this really kind of catches on. You know, the kind of original Hasid, the original Hasid was kind of this antinomian character in some ways. Um, you know, they're, uh, on one hand, yes, they, they do still carefully follow the halakha, the, the Jewish law, but their attitude uh, towards it is, is much more, uh, let's say playful, uh, always emphasizing joy. Um, some of the other sort of movements, let's say the Musa movement, that was very, very popular in certain parts of, of Eastern Europe, I think Lithuania in particular, very kind of serious, very somber. Um, you know, not much smiling and laughing. It's a lot of sort of self recrimination and feeling, feeling bad. And, you know, uh, Hasidism has kind of turned that on its head. Um, so you see certain contemporary uh, Hasid Hasidic movements like Lubavitch or Breslov. They're really kind of happy people, uh, you know, dancing, singing musicians, uh, really, really funny people. Um, and, you know, at the, at the core of what they're doing is, is this Kabbalah uh, that kind of informs everything that they're doing, the sense that their uh, that their life needs to be, part of this tikkun, this effort of repairing, of healing the world. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see that today's, when we think of orthodox today, when we think of sort of the ultra-orthodox community, we think of the Hasidim. We think of these people with like the, the black hats, the fluffy hats and the, the peyots on the side, um, sort, of the, sort of the hair and the beards. Um, you know, this is tends to be what we think of. And um, maybe... Yeah, I was asking, especially uh, because of what you said about the conception of mm. God mm. as, you know, that, that kind of exchange that there is between uh, people and God. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, sounds, it sounds kind of erratic from a monotheistic point of view. Well, yeah, on the other hand, you know, there is still this kind of intimacy, even within sort of, uh, even within the liturgy. Jewish people tend to refer to God as uh, Avinu Malkenu. Avinu is like father, Malkenu king. So you've got these kind of, I think that kind of expresses this almost uh, polarity in terms of the way you relate. And the way Hasidim relate to God um, is very, very personal. 
Uh, I mean, I've been to places like Sfat, where I've, um, which is actually where I bought my first Kabbalistic books. That's another story. Um, that was an adventure in itself. Um, but you, you can hear sometimes these um, Kabbalists and, and Hasidim pray. Um, there's a, a practice called Hitbodidut, um, where they, they pray out in the fields and the forests, you know, out of the synagogue in nature. They're encouraged to do so by the, the great Rab, the Rebbe uh, Nachman of, of Braslav, um, who was originally from the Ukraine. And you hear them praying when they, they speak to God. Um, <clears throat> they're saying Tati, literally Daddy. Dad, in a very, very intimate way of relating like family, you, you know, just, just praying both in, in Hebrew, the Loshan Kodesh, the holy language, uh, but also in whatever vernacular they speak, be it sort of Yiddish or, um, or usually Yiddish, uh, but, you know, even English. Um, so, you know, there, there is very much that sort of intimacy. Um, I, I remember sort of explaining this to a, a friend who was quite a, um, well, not so much a friend because his, his kind of beliefs kind of excluded me from his circle of friends. Uh, I think he saw me as a, a target <clears throat> to evangelize. He's quite a fundamentalist Christian. And um, <clears throat> I was trying to explain to him this, this language of um, thinking of yourself as a child of the divine, the, you know, of, of the divine as being father or even mother. Um, and that's an interesting sort of development. In, even in Kabbalah with a K now, there seems to be much more emphasis on the Shekhinah, the Divine Feminine. Um, I've been studying uh, Zohar with Professor Daniel Matt, and it's, it's very interesting. And so he's he's really this sort of the one of the new great scholars of, of Kabbalah of, of, of this of this age. And um, what's interesting is um, how much um, students in the class are now talking about the Divine Feminine, the feminine aspect of the Divine. And, uh, you know. Uh, the way that we can sort of reimagine, uh, kind of restore perhaps some balance. And that's what Kabbalah largely, the tree of life is essentially about balance. You know, if you get balance, you, you're there, you know, everything connects. And that sort of tiferet, beauty at the center, that's that har harmony between the masculine and the feminine. That, you know, everything kind of centers there, connects there. Um, so that, that's been very interesting, seeing how that's... Uh, um, how the emphasis changes. You know, the text remains the same, but the way we read it uh, changes over time. Um, you know, where we place the emphasis um, changes all the time. So that, that's been interesting to, to watch. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's quite true of every religion. <laughs> I, th I think so. I think so. You, you see it in... Um, you know, in, in, in Taoism, they would say, like, uh, you know, know the masculine but keep to the feminine. Um, you know, uh, there's... Uh, yeah, there is a revival of the feminine aspect of the divine. There is. There is. I think that's, that seems to be... Uh, a trend. <coughs> yeah. yeah, it is a trend across different religious movements. It is. You can see it in Jung's work as well. He said, you know, this is going to be the age where we, we need to recover, rediscover, integrate the anima, you know, we, we need to stop excluding and repressing it. Um, you know, we, we need to sort of properly integrate and incorporate it. And I noticed that seems to be happening more and more in, um, in all different wisdom traditions, uh, not just uh, Kabbalah or Kabbalah, however you want to say it. <laughs> And um, what's the meaning of the you you sort of uh, touched on it a bit, but uh, I wanted to I wanted you to expand more on the tree of life and what's the philosophy and the meaning behind it in traditional Kabbalah as opposed to in ceremonial magic. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, it's you know, in ceremonial magic, it tends to be due with, like, with correspondence and sort of that kind of magic and how this relates to this planet or this. And astrology and the yeah, tarots yeah, yeah. and. In in the um, traditional Kabbalistic tradition, the Tree of Life, these are the Sephirot, the divine attributes. It's a way, the closest way we have to actually understand the divine and to understand how to relate to the divine. To so see these various qualities in in balance in harmony qualities that we also possess both uh within mind body spirit these different levels is it perceived as a progression um, from the tenth to the first 
Yes, it's uh, it's sometimes you hear this term descent for the purpose of an ascent. You know, it's uh, you sort of uh, the process of creation is from the most um, unimaginable kind of abstract ideal to the physical concrete reality. So this journey down the tree through the four worlds. Um, I'll, I'll send you a little <clears throat> diagram that you can probably flash up at, at some point. It starts from the most unknowable to the um, to our tangible sort of reality, if you like, um, all the way up from 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 Keta or and Sof, the um, unending, infinite, eternal, to Malchut kingdom, sort of this uh, sense of um, foundation or, or, or presence. Um, and sort of within this are the, are the divine qualities or attributes, which we ourselves are supposed to, perhaps there's some quality of like theurgy here that we're supposed to cultivate within ourselves. And once we get the, the balance right, um, we are more but selam alokim, made in the image of the divine. So you'll notice that the tree of life, often it maps on to the human form. Um, you know, so um, you'll be able to see that hopefully in some of the diagram uh, that, that I send it, it sort of it maps onto the body. Uh, this is Adam Kadmon, the primordial human, the blueprint for creation. So again, it's it's creation of of everything, time and space, but it's also about the um, creation of, of humanity and how the human is, if you like, a microcosm, um, a sort of microcosm image of the divine um, within our sort of. How. Um... Would they use the tree of life in traditional Kabbalah then? Would they use it in any way? Or is it just a way of depicting the, the creation? And in, in most sort of uh, theoretical, philosophical forms of Kabbalah, it would be used mostly as just a blueprint to better understand uh, different divine qualities and attributes different divine names, when they might be used in the Torah, what this particular name means, which sephirot it relates to. Always really careful as well to recognize that these aren't separate gods or deities, that they are part of a whole. Um, one way, one rabbi explained it to me is, you know, um, it's almost in the way that a prism ref refracts light. It breaks up the white light into sort of separate but it's all part of that light, that one light. But the way we see it or perceive it um, differs according to our capabilities or what we're able to receive. That's what Kabbalah um, means, you know, what we're able to receive. Um, so part of it is trying to um, harmonize, synchronize, resonate with, uh, with this Eskayim, this tree of life with these sephirot to get the balance of these qualities right within ourselves. So how would you do that? I mean, how would you use the tree of life? Example, I'll give you an example using, uh, using three of the, of the sephirot. So let's take um, the example of, uh, of the right side of the tree of life, the sephirot of chesed, which is often translated as loving kindness, which sounds very Buddhist. Um, but it's that, that quality of, of giving, uh, of, of openness and on the left hand side uh, you'll see the quality of gevura. Gevura means uh, well it has lots of different meanings one is restriction judgment strength um, it's to do with like limitation so one side is about sort of giving um, one side is about restriction keeping uh, your distance about boundaries <clears throat> you can think of that as uh, you know what what happens if I you know, if I don't have the sort of the wisdom of balance, if I'm constantly giving and giving and giving and giving, I have nothing, and I'm left with nothing to give. Um, or that sense of of, of contact. Uh, this is an interesting one at the moment. You know, um, we're, we're living in times where we we have to. You know, wisdom tells us to keep separate, to keep away um, from from one another. Um, so there's that wisdom, there's the knowing in a sense, um, when to give, when to sort of um, embody this loving kindness, and when to keep our distance, uh, when to sort of have that sense of restriction, that balance is tiferet, is beauty, that harmony sort of in between. I think you can probably hear my little one in the background now. Um, so it's that, uh, you know, and that's sort of what... Uh, 
that's often how sort of the the, the Kabbalists would, would understand this. You know, they're, they're looking at these divine qualities and trying to recognize, realize, cultivate them within themselves when their day-to-day lives. It is a it is a form of I wouldn't say meditation, but rather a contemplation of uh, the aspects of your life that you have to integrate in order to be whole and closer to the divine, to your divine nature. Yeah, I mean, if you want to do it, you know, you, you'd probably find you know what we refer to as Jewish meditation. I think Arya Kaplan in the sixties and seventies is one of the first to kind of use that that term, and it's probably mainly because there's a lot of Jewish people going east, and he wanted to demonstrate that you know within your tradition, within Kabbalah, you you find meditation. So what's called Jewish meditation today is often um, actually kind of Kabbalah. Uh, theoretical, philosophical, um, with some safer aspects of practical. Um, But there aren't many people that teach this. Um, A a lot of what's called Jewish meditation today might actually be (coughs) kind of adapted forms of Buddhist or Hindu practice. Uh, But there are some forms that sort of have their roots in in the biblical tradition in Sefer Yetzirah or the Zohar, uh, these, these texts. Uh, there aren't that many people that teach them. Um, I think I sort of referred recently on my uh, Facebook profile to one of my uh, friends who's uh, a Hasidic rabbi who's actually just recently um, offering these these classes, these teachings on. Yeah, on Jew- yeah, I, I saw it on your Facebook. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know how much of an audience there is for it, um, but you know, it'd be interesting to see. But this is if you wanted to encounter. Um, how to integrate this, particularly things like the tree of life and these divine attributes, you know, that's where you'd find it. You'd find it in what's referred to as like Jewish meditation um, today, these practices, um, various Kabbalistic and, and uh, Hasidic practices, practices of Hasidut. Uh, this is where you find the practical application of it. Mm. That's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Yeah, thank you very much for this interview, Elliot. It was really no fascinating, and I'm really sure that the members of the symposium will really enjoy this conversation together. Oh, no. Okay, well, take care and be well. So this is it for today's video. If you liked it, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, activate the notification bell so that you won't miss any future video, and as always, stay tuned for all the academic fun. Bye for now. We are